a little bit about who is going to be joining me up here uh, this weekend. Uh, Joe Corona has been in the business just about as long as I have. Um, traded on CBOE Board of Trade, CME, overseas at Life and Urex. Traded um, a lot of different products. Uh, ran his own company for a while, had a prop desk, traded for uh, Barclays for a number of years, uh, BZW. He's a partner uh, of ours. Uh, lived in London for a couple years, as I said. He's uh, won Cynical Snide SOB. He agrees with Gorin quite a bit in his articles. Uh, and uh, he's known to hoard guns. In. OK. I'm going to try and stand here. What we're going to do is we're going to put up um, charts over here. And we're going to walk through theoretical trades, uh, you know, simulated trades. And I'm going to kind of review the decision-making process that can or, or, or could have gone along with these. Most of these are actual trades that we did, I did, or somebody in the office did you know, at some point in time. Uh, I won't be able to recall exactly what the volatilities were at the time and, and so on and so forth, but you'll get the idea. The important thing that, that I'm going to discuss and the important thing that you should take out of here is the decision-making process that you've got to repeat uh, over and over and over again as you deal with these positions when you have a trade. Um, I want it to be somewhat interactive, but I realize a lot of people have flights that are leaving you know, before the seminar officially ends, so I'm going to try to, to roll uh, as quick as I can. But I do really want you people to get involved and ask me questions about you know, what would I do here, what, would I, what could I do there. Now, I might blow you off and, and jump over it, or I might give you a short answer, or I might go off on a tangent, but I want to try and, because uh, I know that this is, these are you know, some of the questions you have about basically battlefield tactics that you, will, you would apply to certain situations. Um, let me just go through my, OK. Quick on my background, um, I'm currently working with Tony at, uh, at STC, working the upstairs trading operation and our internalization operation, the, uh, the, the quasi-market making operation. Um, I've been associated with and I've known Tony for, you know, forever, uh, at least 10 years. I, I've also done. Uh, teaching at the uh, International Trading Institute, occasionally for some of the higher level classes or some of the customized classes. Uh, my background, I've been uh, like, like a real options junkie. Uh, I've bounced around from place to place. An options trader will tend to follow the volatility. And that's kind of what my career has done. I, I, I actually blundered into the, the business by accident in 1980. I was supposed to be a, a teacher. And I needed to get a job while I was looking for a teaching job. And I happened to walk onto the Chicago Board Options Exchange and got a job as a runner. And I got paid $250 a month. And uh, I thought they were trading corn. And I didn't know, you know what the hell was going on. But after a while, I, I started to figure out what was going on. And I've kind of just stayed in the business because I found it interesting and, uh, and, and, and profitable. Um, I started out trading equity options. And I traded equity options on the floor of the CBOE, which is where I first made uh, Tony's acquaintance. Uh, from 80 through about 84, maybe 85, I can't remember exactly. And then I saw that the, uh, the interest rate markets were going nuclear over at the Chicago Board of Trade. So I went down and I traded treasury bond options in the pit from uh, 85, uh, roughly uh, up through the crash. Uh, I mentioned before that I've you know, permanently psychologically scarred by the crash. And uh, through the crash, and then after the crash, things kind of died down a bit because uh, everybody was back on their heels, and the grain market blasted off in 88. So I spent all of 88 trading soybean options and corn options and wheat options and meal and oil options. So I, I took my turn through the commodities, uh, ran that through about 89, and then the currency started to fire up. So I made my way over to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and traded Swiss franc options and Japanese yen options for a couple of years. Uh, Meandered back to the Board of Trade, and again, I got involved with teaching for ITI, and there were an awful lot of, they trained an awful lot of European clients, and there were an awful lot of Germans showing up in my classes that insisted that the only way to trade options was to constantly sell premium, no matter what the level was. So I moved to London uh, so I could trade against them, basically, and I, I ran the, uh, <laughs> and I ran the uh, OTC uh, options desk uh, at BZW uh, for, for two or three years, and that's where I, got involved with uh, the Deutsche Terminkurs, or, or Eurex as it's now known, and I was first introduced to electronic trading uh, and fell in love with electronic trading. And I came back here in 97, and I traded Bunds and Bobbles and the DAX and the uh, Eurostox 50 futures and options from upstairs 
uh, in the middle of the night, obviously, I had to get up at uh, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning Frankfurt time uh, and trade. And then Tony asked me to join his operation about a year ago. So that's kind of uh, my track record. I've, I've done a little bit of everything. Uh, I think the only market I really haven't ever traded options in is might be the meats. I uh, haven't done any pork bellies, hogs, or pigs, but that's about it. Everything else I've been involved in at one time or another. And as you get more and more sophisticated with options and option strategies, uh, you know, each market has its own individual nuances, uh, you know, just as the equity markets do. But you'll find that these, these strategies that you're learning here today are valid for all markets once you take into account what the individual nuances of those markets are. So what you're learning here for equity options You'll be able to use in soybeans, you'll be able to use in lumber, you'll be able to use in coffee, cocoa, and sugar, and orange juice, and, and anything else you want to trade. You know, the energy complex out in New York is humming right now. There's, there's stuff to do there. Um, so, you know, options, after a while, once you, once you factor in the nuances of the underlying, at some point, if you get, you know, comfortable enough with these strategies, you'll see that options are options are options, and you can kind of follow the party. You know, if the crap table's hot, you can roll over there, and then if the roulette wheel gets hot, you can move over there, and that's kind of like how it is with, the, with options. You can move from market to market if you want to, if you want to. Um, as far as my technical background, I don't even want to pretend to stand up here and, and address you as like I'm some sort of technical analysis guru. I, um, I would imagine everybody in this room is probably a better chartist than I am. Um, but uh, what I do try to do is I, I've worked really hard at trying to integrate option strategies into my technical analysis to give myself a little bit of a powerful, uh, a more powerful approach or a more uh, flexible approach to, to the way I attack some of the strategies that I do get signals in. Um, my mentor when I first started trading was what was back then known as a tape reader. Okay, we didn't have anything back then. I mean, I, I don't don't want to come off sounding like you know your grandfather. And then, you know, I walked uphill through a blizzard to the exchange, but we had nothing. Uh, there were no computers, there were no packages uh, like, like Aspen Graphics or AT, nothing like that. So we basically kept little point and figure charts on, on our trading cards. Everything had to be able to fit inside of your pockets, you know, while you were down in the pit. Uh, and you had the old rolled up charts that you would take home and un unroll them at night and, and, and pencil in the high, low, close and, and draw all your support and resistance lines. But, the, guy, the first guy I worked for was a tape reader. Um, so he basically would just observe the market and you would observe you know, leaders and laggards and kind of read the tape and see which stocks you know, were kind of running into trouble, running out of gas, which ones looked strong, you know, which ones held up well on pullbacks versus the others, which ones uh, you know, didn't perform as well on rallies. And you just kind of make notes of where le different levels of activity occurred. And those became your basic intuitive support and resistance levels that are, are now you know, graphically illustrated for you by, by numerous packages. Um, in the mid-80s, I ran into a guy on the floor of the Board of Trade by the name of Peter Steidelmeyer, uh, who developed uh, something called the Market Profile System. And I used to use that uh, quite often. I'm going to show you an example of that later. Um, it, it is basically constructs, and this is more of a day trading uh, inside the pit type of tool, but I, I found that it can be an excellent timing device. Um, I suggest you look into it. It's, it. It constructs a graphic representation of the distribution of time, of time prices or ticks uh, over different time periods. It can give you an idea of what the, the uh, underlying activity is uh, in, a, in, a, in an underlying during the course of a day. Uh, different shapes or different types of distributions will show you different types of activity. Uh, that got me interested in technical analysis and I pursued it like everybody else. I just grabbed as many books as I could and read as many books as I could. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with Larry and Kevin and, and Dave and uh, you know, all the guys on, the, on that website. I mean, I would, uh, you know, for the people that are on the tradingmarkets.com website, in order to read their columns every day, uh, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, you know, I would, I would have cut off my little finger for that opportunity because back then you had nothing. You, you guys have no idea how lucky you are. Um, anyways, I, uh, I tried to integrate options into my technical systems. Uh, you know, it was somewhat difficult. Because, you know, because you're always running a side-by-side -side market making operation, but, but I've done that. Like I mentioned last night, I've got to kind of be schizophrenic and divide my brain in half and keep my big market making book separate from my back book or my technically oriented strategies. Okay, so I've worked really hard at, at trying to uh, integrate option <laughs> strategies with technical signals and that, that's kind of what I've been doing as my, my passion while I'm doing my market making jobs. It's also my other passion. Um, yeah, presently I'm at uh, I'm at STC LLC. 
uh, as a senior trader on our desk, uh, running our, our quasi-market maker operation along with Chris and Tony. Um, I am also uh, have my own a consulting firm, and occasionally I'll do, you know, little consulting gigs for people that are trying to set up operations in faraway exotic places that I like to go to. Uh, other than that, uh, I use those as kind of intelligence gathering uh, operations as well. If I go to Singapore or Malaysia or Australia or somewhere like that to, to help somebody set up, uh, set up an options operation, I'll check it out. And if I see anything that really seems to be out of whack to me, then I'll, I might go there uh, for a while. Um, and I also, uh, I also the mo you know, the, uh, Tony and Chris, uh, and, and everybody in the room here are, uh, are focused on equities for this weekend and equity options. But I also am active in the futures market. I still follow the bonds. I've spent a, a lot of my life in bonds and currencies and grains, so I follow them all. And I still trade them all actively you know, for, in my personal account. And I do a lot of the strategies I'm going to talk about today, I, I, I will have you know, going on in other underliers you know, concurrently with some of the stuff I'm doing in the equity market. OK. This module, okay, and my whole theme for this weekend and what I'm trying to, what we're trying to bring across here, and as you well know, especially after this last week, trading is a war, okay? This is combat, there's real money on the table, and what we're trying to do here this weekend is we're just trying to upgrade your weaponry, upgrade your arsenal. Tony and Chris have spent the last day, day and a half, introducing different strategies and introducing the nuances of these strategies to give you a choice of different weapons that you can apply to different situations. So we've been introduced to a series of different types of spreads, what their characteristics are, what type of markets uh, they're best applied to. So you've been delivered a set of weapons, okay? I want to stress that these are an overlay for the systems that you're currently using. Whatever decision-making process that you go through when you decide to take a trade, <clears throat> this is an overlay for you. I'm not going to present uh, a technical system and say, you know, this is the system I use and it's back tested and it's done this and this and this. These are all going to be overlays for your system. So whatever decision making process you go through, whether you get a chart signal, uh, a fundamental signal, uh, your grandmother calls you, whatever happens that, that triggers you into making a trade, uh, you, can, you may have the possibility of using one of these strategies to give you a better edge or to fit your view uh, a little bit better than just a, a, a plain long or short position. Okay, so these are to be meant to be used in conjunction with strategies that you're using now. Okay. Why options? Okay, why do I want to use options? They're a pain in the ass. Okay, the bid ask spreads are wide. I've got to watch them all the time. They've got all these weird Greek things. Um, you know, never seems like I'm flat. There's always something going wrong. Why would I want to use options? Okay. Um, it really, it breaks down to, to seven different categories that I'm going to cover. The first one is opportunity. Okay. Now, if you're a technical analyst, you know, you've got to agree with this, uh, that one of, the, one of the basic tenets of technical analysis is that anything, any activity that human beings are involved, involved in uh, tends to be erratic, tends to run in cycles as the, the cycle of human emotions consistently repeat themselves. Uh, Greed, fear, panic, complacency, arrogance. Um, all these different emotions, uh, hell, we've seen in the entire cycle in one year. Uh, all these different emotions are, are repeatedly manifested in the marketplace. Um, you can see them especially manifested in option premiums. If you, if you see the VIX index, you can see this fluctuation where people go from complacency to completely out of their minds, freaked out, back through the cycle of complacency to arrogance to fear to panic over and over again, okay? This is an additional facet of the market that you can take advantage of if you use options, okay? Now, granted, you can analyze volatility and analyze uh, different levels of, of fear and greed and panic and construct futures or underlying positions around that, but when you construct option positions to take advantage of this, well, you give yourself a, an extra edge okay, that, that you can use to take advantage of this market behavior. Okay, here's a little chart of the VIX. Now, I haven't updated this. Uh, I, I put this up about, I don't know, well, April 2nd. Okay, so I don't have the big meltdown here that just took place, but, you know, here's an example. Looking at the VIX, which is the uh, S&P 100 volatility index, as you guys well know. Here's the crash of 87, okay, that was beautiful. And then, uh, you know, we come back down, 
we get a little complacent, and then boom, here's the crash of 89. Uh, here's the downturn, the down times in the mid-90s. You can see this thing got really low. Um, you know, the markets were, were gen generally moving higher. Uh, everybody got fairly complacent. And then we had the uh, Far East crisis, uh, long-term capital blowing out here. And this is the peak of the current meltdown. From here, it's now come back down to about, you know, it's stuck under 30, and now I think it's just juggling around just above 30 at some point. Um, but anyways, this is a pretty good graphic representation of, uh, of basically human emotion swinging back and forth. Okay, Huge peaks of panic and fear. Um, huge valleys of arrogance and complacency that take place. And these are the swings that you can take advantage of when you're trading options and you're, you're constructing option strategies. Not only that, the VIX is a, is a, is a measurement of the volatility inherent in an index. Each stock has its own VIX. You know, if you can chart the, the historical volatility and the implied volatilities of, of any individual stock, and a lot of these charting packages that are available out there, and many others, can give you this capability, you can see when there's a, you know, you can look at the fear and panic that takes place in the individual stocks, not only in the indices. And sometimes you can find things that are occurring uh, when, when they aren't in the indices. So there are all sorts of measurements you can use to chart you know, when a stock might be oversold or overbought or when there's a huge degree of fear or panic in the market or a huge degree of complacency, <laughs> you go through and you analyze the volatilities because the, basically there's no better indicator of human emotion than option premiums, okay? Because again, they are all insurance policies. When people are freaking out, they want insurance. When they feel complacent, they don't, they don't want insurance. They don't think they need insurance because they're arrogant, okay? So option premiums are, are a great you know, way to measure what, people, what the psychology of the marketplace is and pick up turning, and pick up turning points. You know, Larry Connors, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with the, uh, the Connors VIX reversal series. Those are some awesome strategies. Those are some awesome strategies. And you can construct those with individual stocks as well. Okay? You'll get an idea of when the market might turn and when, the, and when volatility might turn. Okay? Now the mean reversion, let me just click this here. Let me get back, let me get back to my uh, game plan here. Okay, so that was opportunity, okay? A lot of extra opportunity when you involve options. Flexibility, okay, flexibility is a big one. Um, you're no longer restricted to just up or just down, okay? You can take on positions that reflect magnitude, okay? It can be up big or down big, or it can be up small or down small. Uh, you can construct positions that will reflect your opinion on velocity. Is this thing gonna move fast? Or is this thing going to move slow? Timing. Is the move going to happen now? Or is it going to go sideways for a while and then the move might happen later? You can construct a position to take advantage of that. Uh, volatility, meaning the current implied volatility. Is it too high? Is it historically too high? Well, who's to say? Okay. But relatively speaking, is it a little too high? Is it too low? Is it just right? Okay. If you have some sort of signal showing up in your systems, you can take the current volatility structure and use that to your advantage to give you an additional bit of edge, okay? Expected volatility, okay? What is your viewpoint on expected volatility? Are you expecting volatility to pick up? You know, are we, are we, are we late in the summer and everything's all the volatility, all the implied volatilities are in the toilet and you're looking for a little rock and roll this fall? You can construct positions to take advantage of that. You know, is it Christmas time and they're beating the crap out of implied volatility but you think January is going to be out of control? You can take advantage of that. Is it late April and everybody's earnings were crap and the volatilities are sky high, but now you think the market might go sideways and consolidate for the summer? You can take advantage of that. As many opinions as you have about different types of market behaviors and market views, you can construct a strategy that will benefit from those, you know, if you're right. Okay? Okay, I'm not going to say that every one of these things will work. Yes, you are wrong. I am definitely wrong a lot, you know, probably more than I am right. But if you can stack the probabilities up on your side, It'll help you to be less wrong when you are wrong and more right when you are right, okay? And that's what you're looking for. Okay? Uh, complex views can be expressed, okay? Up but slow, down and fast, uh, sideways for three weeks and then up. Uh, up with volatility getting crushed, up with volatility getting, getting cranked up, you know, down with volatility getting crushed, sideways uh, for a month. Um, Volatility getting smoked, volatility getting bid, uh, any kind of combination. If you look at all the different variables that we go through when we go through our checklist, uh, our, 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 progressive, our list of progressions, 
uh, you can see that the, the, the kind of combinations you can put together almost a thousand different combinations of viewpoints of the market. Um, your position, uh, I mean, one of the, one of the huge aspects of, of flexibility uh, is that the position can be modified as you go along to fit your changing market views. Um, looking at all the different strategies that have been introduced here today and yesterday, you can see that a lot of them have different pieces of each other embedded in them, and you can add or subtract bits, bits and pieces from positions to convert their entire strategy in midstream. Okay? You can take a bull spread uh, looking for a bullish move, and if suddenly you hit resistance and decide it's going to go sideways, you can flip that into a butterfly. Okay? And if you go sideways for three weeks and then you get a breakout signal, you can buy a straddle and flip that into a long strangle. Okay? Or you can do a bull spread, convert it to a butterfly, and then decide that volatility is too high and you think we're going to go sideways, and you can sell the strangle and now you're short a straddle. You know, all these different chess moves you can do with, volatility, with, with option positions, and this is one of the reasons I, I like the flexibility. Another one, and I think this is a huge one, I know this has been huge for me in my trading and in my lifetime, and I, I think this is one of, the, one, of the, one of the points that leads to uh, significantly higher profits sometimes with option strategies than just underlying, is the fact that you can roll your positions. Okay? Psychologically speaking, I mean, I'm speaking for myself, but I know a lot of people run into this, a lot of times, you know, we know that we're supposed to let the winners run and cut your losers off, but it's really difficult psychologically to let the winners run. If you're at the card table and you win a few hands and that pot on the table gets bigger and bigger, uh, to me anyways, all I can think about is what happens if I lose that whole pot, okay, rather than what I started with. Um, rolling option positions, being able to take money off the table yet maintain market exposure is one of the key things. It really increases my comfort level and allows me to stay with a trade a lot longer. If I can systematically take some of the money I've, I've invested and some of the profits I've accrued off the table, but yet still, still maintain a market exposure, I have a lot better tendency of staying with the trade a lot longer and getting that second standard deviation or third standard deviation move or that, that wave two up. Um, rather than chickening out on the first uh, pullback and taking the whole thing off the table and then sitting there like this going, God, I knew it was going to do that and not having anything on. Um, rolling, you know, probably almost as, as great as any one uh, facet of option trading, being able to roll positions has really done wonders for my trading and I really suggest that you know, uh, people, people think about that because psychologically it puts you in a really comfortable place. If you can get your initial investment off the table, then you're playing with the house's money uh, you have a lot better chance of sticking with the trade, you know, all the way to the bitter end. Um, another, another great facet is the fact that you have more exit strategies available to you. If you want to bail out of the market, you've got different things you can do. You can apply the underline, you can apply puts, you can apply calls. There are different moves that you can do to bail out. If I have a long call spread, if I have a bull spread using calls, I can either sell it but if they make me a crappy market on that, I know that I can buy a put, sp put spread, okay? Bear spread plus bull spread equals zero, okay, if they're of the same strikes. You know, you guys know by now, or I hope you know by now, that a, a short put spread and a long call spread are actually the same thing, okay? Because they're two parts of an inert object called a box, which is basically a treasury bill, okay? So I can go after both sides of the market because I, know, I now know how to construct synthetics. I can use both sides of the market. You know, here's a huge problem that people run into. You know, and I know that some people's accounts are capable of some things and some, some others aren't. You buy a call, okay, and that thing goes deep in the money. Well, what happens to a deep in the money option? Well, the higher price it gets, the wider the market makers are allowed to make the, make the, make the bid and offer. So when it comes time for you to get out, they ream you for a point, you know, when you're trying to get out of the thing. Now that you know about synthetics, you can take this deep in the money call and rather than selling that, you can go over here to the opposing put which is now trading for a half a buck or, you know, on the market, market on that might be five eighths bid at uh, 11 steens or something like that. You can just sell the put and sell the stock one for one and know that that is, now, that is a synthetic short call. You have just sold the call, okay, and you no longer have to get raped by the bid ask spread on a deep in the money option, okay. Deep in the money options for the market makers in the pit, they have high deltas. They're difficult for them to hedge. Well, they're not really difficult to hedge, but they like to say that. Uh, high delta option 
and they pull liquidity away from those, whereas the, the way out of the money put is a low delta option. Those guys aren't that worried about them, so they'll make you a tight market on those. So you can use that one to exit rather than the deep in the money one. That's something you can think about now that you know about synthetics. Okay? Your account may not, the resulting position will be something called a reversal, okay? which is basically a locked arbitrage type of trade. Okay? And your account may or may not be capable you know, for margin considerations, and I have to you know, say I'm, I'm I'm not familiar with exactly what the margin is on something like that to do that, but if you can, you can save yourself an awful lot of money on exiting using those strategies, using the synthetic strategies that you've learned here. You know, if you monitor those, you can save yourself an awful lot of money by not having to cross an enormous bid-ask spread when you're getting out of a position that has a high, getting out of an option that has a high absolute price. Okay, because the higher price the option gets to be, the wider these guys are allowed to make their markets. Okay, so there are more exit strategies available. Scalability, okay, another good one. When you're constructing a position, or deconstructing a position for that matter, uh, being able to use the building block approach, uh, being able to put your toe in the water somewhat, uh, is really important to me because it allows me to be able to jump my signals. Okay, I can apply strategies and layers. You know, suppose I'm looking at a market that looks to me like it might be making a rounding bottom or it, you know, it looks like maybe the selling's kind of dried up and I'm, I'm getting you know, some seriously oversold indicators and maybe I'm getting some bullish divergences. But the market action really isn't telling me it's ready to go up yet. But I'm thinking that you know, I gotta keep my eye on this sucker because I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna get something here soon. You, know, you can start to put your positions on in layers. You can take a, a kind of a passive approach and apply some sort of passive bullish strategy while you're waiting for the real signal. And I'll, just, I'll just pull one right out of my brain. You know, suppose I've got something that's making a long saucer bottom. Okay, and the, the, the ranges have really tightened down, and it looks like the selling's kind of dried up, and maybe I'm getting a little divergence you know, on, on RSI or stochastic or something like that. I'm thinking, you know, this thing, it may not be ready to go up yet, but I certainly think it's done going down. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, take, a, a, you know, I'm gonna take a passive bullish strategy and apply that first. And then when I get the real hardcore signal, then I'll lay the rest on. Okay, so I'll, I might put on something that I call the crank, where <laughs> when, uh, when something's looking like it's making a saucer bottom and I think I might get a bullish signal at some point, I'll approach it in layers and I might go in there and sell a put spread. Okay, because I, once again, I, I abhor open-ended risk. So when I'm gonna sell puts or in a situation where you might sell puts, and I, I'm gonna, all the strategies I'm gonna talk about today, I'm gonna talk about like I'm trading them in my personal account, not my professional account, okay? Because that's where we're all coming from. I'm gonna sell a put spread. Okay, because I don't like to have the open-ended risk. So I'm going to sell a put, but then I'm going to buy a put of a lower strike. So I'm going to collect a little money for that, and it's got a positive delta, uh, and I'm going to sit back and I'm going to see what happens. And as the, as the market traces out its saucer bottom, uh, and, I, and it starts to build some activity, like it looks like it might rally, I get some sort of signal that, yes, this is it. This is the rally. What I will then do is take the premium I gen generated by selling that put spread and buy calls with it. Okay, so I've spent nothing. Okay, but I've got this bullish position that I like to call the crank because if you plot it, it looks like a crank. Okay, but that's, the, that's what I mean by layering or a building block approach. You can kind of stick your toe in the water with a passive strategy, and then once you get the actual signal, you can apply your hardcore strategy. And a lot of times you can use proceeds from the passive strategy to finance your hardcore strategy or vice versa. Okay, so that's just an example that I yanked out of my head. Um, I had one of those in gold in 1998 when the Bank of England had their auction and it went nuts, that was good. Um, so it allows you to jump signals, like I was saying. You, you know, a lot of times we'll be monitoring charts and you, I, and everybody else on the planet, well, a lot of us are watching these charts like hawks and we're waiting for the whatever, right? And you know, a lot of us are, are really familiar with, you know, read the same books and looking at the same things. And a lot of times when you do get the signal, everybody else gets it at the same time, and it's a road race to see who can get in first, and the stock blasts off, and you're trying to do this and that and the other thing. This allows you to anticipate the signals a little bit and kind of have something, a little something happening in case you miss the hardcore signal, you're in the John or something. Um, I, like, I like that. I like to be able to jump my signals and, and, and take, a, take a passive approach and then, and then attack it with an active approach. Uh, positions can be removed the same way. You get a position on, it goes your way, uh, you can take off parts of it, again, to increase your comfort level. You know, if you have a position on, you, you buy some calls, you think the market's going up, you can roll them, you can scale them. I buy 10 calls, it gets to one resistance level, I'll take off three of them, see what's happening, okay? 
bounces around there a little bit and moves higher. Okay, hits another resistance level. I'll, I'll get rid of a couple more. Now I got five. You know, or I can roll them like I was talking about earlier. You know, this scalability and flexibility with options is one of the things that allows me to really uh, milk my trades. Okay, milk my trades. Now you don't make as much sometimes as you will make on just a straight out, flat out underlying position. You know, sometimes you'll say to yourself, well, geez, I could have just bought the underlying at 15 and went up to 60. I would have made 10 points, but I bought calls for three bucks and, you know, so on and so forth. I only ended up making seven bucks. You know, but the fact of the matter is, it's, it's a question of comfort and psychology to me. Okay. I am much more comfortable being able to add and subtract things in layers, you know, and know that my risk is, is always uh, predetermined and contained. All right, staying power. Staying power is very important. Um, I'm sure I have, you have, and everybody has been, you know, jerked around by intermittent noise uh, while we're trying to enter a trade. We get some kind of signal or we're trading against a support or resistance level. Uh, and you get some short-term noise in the market that, that may jump around and stop you out, okay? And you, you get a signal again and you get stopped out and you get repeatedly stopped out and finally you lose confidence. And you say, the hell with it, I'm not going to take that again. And then it blasts off like you thought it was the whole time. Maybe I got the signal at 11 o'clock and I got in and then I got subjected to the lunchtime jerk session that a lot of these markets have. And maybe a bunch of locals in the pit decided to run stops. Yes, we do do that. We know where they are. Uh, not because the brokers tell us, but because guys like me are asked, where would you put a stop if you were trading? <laughs> and you know, when I was in the pits, I would look at the charts and I would say, you know, technically this looks really bad. It looks like it just issued a sell signal. If I were a technical trader, I would sell it here and I'd put my stop right here and then we go, okay, great, we'll go check that out and see what's up there. Uh, you know, it allows you to avoid some of those stop runs, you know, getting stopped out and then having the move take place. You know, like Goran says, they always check you one last time, you know, before they let it go, you know, just to, just to see what's going on up there. Um, true, very true. You know, I was, I was part of that. You know, I, that's what you do in the pit. You sniff out paper like a bird dog and you examine it and see what it's, see what it's all about sometimes. My understanding was that the market makers were pretty good about using point and figure charts even now. Is that still true or at least that's right? Yeah, the question was, you know, market makers uh, are pretty good at using point and figure charts even now. Yeah, definitely. There's a definite lot of crossover. I mean, theoretically speaking, market makers are supposed to have no opinion. I want to be neutral at all times and I just want to, you know, capture the edge. Well, you can't do that. That's not true. I mean, you have to stack your position one way or the other and you have to be aware of what, where the levels are and where the activity is going to pick up and what the, and what the paper is going to be thinking. I mean, if you violate a, a significant chart point, you know, you can't stand there like an idiot and just, you know, with a, like a giant catcher's mitt and, and, let everybody, and let everybody rain down on you. Yes, yes, of course they are. I mean, everybody's a little bit of both. You should. You should. I mean, I do. Uh, you had to in self-defense, you know, back in my day. I mean, yes, there are people that are sheet monkeys, and their job are just to read the numbers and execute on the prices. You know, those are their jobs. But then there's always the big, you know, brain in the jar upstairs. That, you know, the puppet master is manipulating these levels, and hopefully the puppet master has some department or somebody who's telling him, hey, this stuff just broke out. You better raise the volatility levels and he'll push a button and the volatility will go up and the sheet monkeys won't even know what happened. <laughs> you know, they'll just, all of a sudden their offers will be higher. They may or may not even notice. You know, but, but, that, but, that's, but that's the way these uh, professional option trading uh, organizations are run. You know, there are people pulling the strings and there are people whose job it is just to stand there and execute. Okay, and they don't have to have, they, they don't have, to have any idea what's going on. You know, the inventory, every trade they make goes into the inventory and the big brain upstairs is analyzing this and looking at the flow and saying, oh, we're getting a little bit too short puts here. We'll raise our put offers and raise our put bids. Or, oh, we're getting a little too loaded up with calls here. We're going to lower our call bids and lower our call offers. And they'll change it and these guys won't even know. That's, that's the way that type of operation works. Okay, so it allows you to avoid short-term setbacks, getting, getting knocked out by stop runs, uh, some missed timing being off by a day or two. You know, options will allow you to stay in rather than repeatedly getting stopped out. All right, big one, leverage. Okay, control large positions with a fraction of the capital. Okay, the leverage thing is probably the biggest thing, uh, especially if you've got limited amount of funds. You know, rather than buying, uh, you know, a thousand shares of a $50 stock and putting up 50 grand, you know, you might be able to buy 10 calls for three bucks and put up three grand, okay, and control virtually the same position, okay? 
And you can also build what I call self-pyramiding positions. Okay? And we all know that it's good to cut your losers, and we also have been told that it's good to add to your winners. A lot of times, you know, the couple of the spreads Tony talked about right at the end, the back spread. Okay? These are the type of positions that are more or less self-pyramiding. You can construct these so that if the move that you're anticipating takes place, they explode and unfold and, and produce their own leverage in the direction that you want. But if the move that you're looking for doesn't take place, they remain inert. Okay, and you can construct these and leave these things lying around like landmines. Uh, ultimately, do these things have risk? Yes, under a specific set of situations. If you can construct back spreads or volatility spreads, and I have a few examples of these and we'll talk about them more, but if you construct those and a lot of time goes by and the market just drifts around and then it starts to drift through your short strike that you sold to finance purchasing some further out of the money options, then you're definitely exposed. You're definitely exposed. But if, you look, if you're looking at, you know, the, the added edge you have as a chartist or a technician is you have a specific signal that's calling for a certain type of behavior in the market that's either going to happen now or you're going to be wrong. I mean, when I, when I get a signal, if it doesn't pan out, you know, you know, if relatively short period of time, I'm usually looking for the exit anyways. You know, so with the back spread, um, that type of thing, you know, you can put those on and under certain circumstances. And if you're right, you know, it's huge. And if you're wrong, eh, it's no harm really, you know, if you get the specific situations for those. All right, last but certainly not least, probably foremost, risk control, okay? You're able to adapt the strategies to your individual risk appetite, okay? So depending on what type of capital, what, what your money management uh, protocol is, you know, how much you're willing to risk, whether you risk it based on percentage or an absolute amount, or you have some sort of volatility risk management system, you can adapt the situation. You know, what calls for maybe uh, an underlying position, you can modify and maybe have a call position. And if you don't have the, uh, if your risk management won't allow you to pay the full price of a, of a call, you can go into a bull spread, which costs less. Uh, there are a lot of different ways you can adapt the options trades to do your, your particular money management situation. Uh, I like to use them a lot. The second point here is control risk on existing positions. I like to use them a lot as automatic stops. You know, if I happen to have a trade on an underlier and it's, let's say it happens to work, uh, it's profitable, you know, rather than subjecting myself to event risk uh, in certain situations, if I'm nervous about something that might or might not happen overnight, like say it's Microsoft earnings or something like that, or some kind of war or something, um, I'll use puts, you know, a trailing put position as a trailing stop. You know, if I get a, if I get a breakout signal in a stock and it's at 50 and I buy 1,000 shares and it runs up to 60, you know, I might buy some 55 puts, and then if it runs up to 70, I might move those up to 65, and if it runs up to 90, I'll move them up to 80, but I'll, you know, a lot of times always have those puts in place, you know, just in case if something ugly happens overnight. And will I lose money on all those puts? Yeah, yeah, but I'm making more in the stock because my position is what? Long puts, long stock? It's a call, okay, it's a call. Um, so, but you can use those for risk management, okay? Same thing on the short side. You know, uh, you know, lately it's been a lot more, uh, you know, other than last week, it's uh, been a lot more productive to be short than long. You know, you can always use calls as a cap, you know, to protect yourself in case there's a huge run. You know, a lot of times you'll have to weather some short-term storms like the Fed, Fed deciding to cut interest rates during expiration week and things like that. Um, a lot of times it's good. You know, if you've got a short position, you're really convinced the market is ultimately going down, but there might be some short-term noise, and you want to protect yourself from an outside event like a, you know, Bundesbank-style intervention that we had, you know, you could place some calls in there to protect you, and when you decide whatever the threat was is gone or over, then you can remove those calls. Yes, they'll cost you some money. Yes, options are insurance, okay, but you can use them as such, and a lot of times that insurance is really worth it. Uh, you know, like... Uh, like Tommy Lee Jones said in Lonesome Dove, he says, better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. You know, sometimes it's good to have that stuff in place. Okay? Again, use it to minimize your drawdowns. Use it as protection. You use parabolics to follow trending markets to set your stops. Move your puts along with the parabolic. Okay? Something like that. Okay, liquidity and access. Now, me standing up here and talking about all these different strategies and Tony and Chris standing up here and talking about all these different strategies really wouldn't be worth anything because of the bid-ask spreads that you guys are forced to cross and the commissions that you're forced to pay, okay? 
Uh, just to recap one last time, we're working to change that with this iSpreads website. Uh, we're going to provide deeper and tighter markets. Um, you'll have electronic access if you, if you set up the right brokerage relationships. So you'll be able to point and click and execute instantaneously, which I know is very important to a technical trader. You can't afford to take a signal and then be on the phone with some idiot while he's trying to quote you some sort of spread and you know, listen to the market makers on the floor jack him around for 15 minutes while you're trying to get it on. And meanwhile, the market's moving. You can't afford that. You need to have electronic execution, electronic confirmation. It needs to be close or semi-close to instantaneous. Does that exist now? Uh, not really. Uh, in some forms, in some places. Are we working really hard to bring that to you? Yes. Um, as far as the iSpreads website, like Tony said, it's not functional now. You won't be able to trade through it right this second. However, you will be able to access it. And uh, like he, he said, one of his associates that's in the brokerage business has said that he is able to execute on those prices almost 70% of the time because those inside prices that we're, we're displaying for you are what the prices really should be if the market maker was making tight markets like they should in those structures. So they're good as far as indications go as to where you could probably execute stuff. You know, rather than just paying their ridiculous bid-ask spread, you can look at the indications and send your orders down at those prices and stand a pretty good chance of getting executed because that's really where the market should be, okay, not the market that's advertised. Uh, will that thing be up and running? Soon, I hope. Soon, I hope. Uh, as a user, uh, which ultimately I will be again, I'll use that thing. You better believe it. Um, I'm a huge fan of electronic trading. Like I said, I trade in all these different markets as well. Would I like to use that thing as a user? Yeah, you better believe it. I'll be all over that thing. Um, you know, at first I'll be on the other side of it because I'm trying to bring it to life, but later on when I'm wherever I am, wherever I'm going, uh, I'll, be, uh, I'll be a user as well. Uh, it's got the RFQ function, the request for, qu for quote function. You, call it, you see some kind of complex strategy you want to put together. You hit that thing, it's going to pop up on my desk or one of the traders in our room's desks, and we'll make you a price, and it'll be good. It'll be good for some, for some size, and it'll be good, it'll be good for some, uh, you'll have a nice tight market, uh, depending on how many legs there are, and you'll have some depth, and we'll trade it with you. you know, we're, we're good for it. Uh, instant entry and exit. Okay, with electronic trading, you get the signal, you can get in. You get the signal to bail, you can get out. Okay. Again, I know that in the equity options market, these are not realities at the present, but these are the things that we're really working toward. Okay? All right. Time for a little meat. Where's my laser pointer? Okay, here we go. We're going to start looking at strategies and we're going to start looking at applications. Uh, what are we on the... When do we break three? Okay, fine. Um, strategy selection. Okay, choose your weapon. The first thing you want to do when you're looking at constructing a trade, when, you're, when you think you're going to receive a signal or you have received a signal, you want to examine the landscape. You want to see what the situation is in the market. Examine the battlefield. See what the layout is. What's been going on and analyze all the different variables that are going to have to go into construction of an option strategy, the different things you have to monitor. Remember, these are the things that are going to give you the extra edge, okay? So you've got to analyze these things and then select the appropriate strategy. Analyze the variables and then you've got to look at your view, okay? What is my view? What is my signal telling me, okay? What do I have? Do I have a buy signal? Do I have a sell signal? Do I have a sideways signal? What is the magnitude? Do I think it's going to go up hard, up slow? What does your view tell you, okay? And then you have to look at your risk and your money management strategy. You know, what am I allowed to do? How much of this could I put on? You know, what are going to be my risk parameters? Where do I get in? Where do I get out? Okay? You should almost have this done before you, get, before you enter the trade, okay? So you have to try to anticipate these things. Um, going forward here. You have a look at the battlefield, okay? I've gotten a signal, or I think I'm going to get a signal. I mean, it's really good for you to try and anticipate the signals you're going to get. You know, we all know that you, you have a good idea that something might be, something might be cooking. Now, things can, things can pop up out of the blue, and they do, okay? But it's good to do your homework. What's the implied volatility, okay? What is the current implied volatility? What are the at-the-monies? What are the away-from-the-monies? 
What does the skew look like? Does the skew give me any sort of an edge? Uh, okay, well, how do I value the implied volatility? What's a good way to do that? I mean, how do I know if it's cheap or if it's, if it's fat? Well, a good way to do that is look at the historical volatility. Look at the long-term historical volatility. Uh, there are various websites where you can pull that up. Tony mentioned the iVolatility.com. I'm sure there's plenty of them that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, Option Index, Option View, places like that. Have a look at the long-term historical volatility. Okay, what's the recent volatility been? If you have a chance, try and find some of those volatility cones or plot your own volatility cones so you can see what the range has been on the volatility for the time frame of the option that you're looking at. Okay, so try and get an idea whether you think it's historically underpriced or overpriced or fair priced. Okay, if that gives you an edge, then you have to build that into your position, whether or not the volatility is fairly priced, expensive, or cheap. Um, does the skew give you an edge? Okay, let's say I get a buy signal. Okay, I get a buy signal, and the volatility is fairly priced, but there's this huge smile. Okay, there's a huge smile like this. And the at-the-money options are the cheapest options, and the away-from-the-money options seem to be trading really fat at a really high volatility. If I get a buy signal under those circumstances, to me, that's screaming bull spread, okay? Because I'm going to be able to buy the at-the-money option at the lower volatility and sell the away-from-the-money call at a much higher volatility, okay? So I get a little bit of an edge there. And if the market rolls, you have to remember that the skew, and I'm just using my hand here, and I'm sorry, but... Uh, the skew is a dynamic thing. It doesn't sit in one place. It moves with the market. Okay? So if I were to buy calls at this volatility and sell calls at this volatility and the market did indeed go up, then these calls that I sold are going to go down here and these puts that I, that I, or these calls that I bought are going to go up here. Okay? And that skew is going to work for me in volatility terms. Okay? So these are things. Do I, should the retail guy get very anal about the skew? No way. No way. Okay? But if there's something barking at you, I mean, if it's just standing out like a sore thumb, then by all means, you take advantage of that, okay? Um, liquidity. You know, probably the biggest pain in the rear end is when you get a signal, a really, really nice signal in some stock, and then you pull up the option page and you, can, you see that the volume is two and the open interest is four, you know? <clears throat> and, and, and there's nothing you can do about that. You know, all I can say to you in that case, it might be beneficial to determine what sector that stock is in and go look at some other stocks in the same sector and see if you have a similar type of setup and look for one that's got more liquid, uh, you know, a more liquid options market. Um, I was talking with somebody last night and they were saying that Gorin sold a whole bunch of calls in the RLX index. Uh, I didn't know that that index, the options on that index were, were that liquid. I was surprised and now I know. But uh, you could also go to those if, uh, if you have a market maker operation, like if they're on Philly, I think Susquehanna usually runs the, runs the shop and most of those uh, different broad sector indices, you might have a shot at getting something on in the index itself. You know, but you'll have to check. You'll have to examine and evaluate the liquidity, because if the liquidity is poor, then they're, they're going to they're gonna carve you up on the way in, they're going to carve you up on the way out. You know? And if you're right, you're going to make a little bit of money, but if you're wrong, they're going to they're nail you to the cross. Uh, so that's one of the factors that has to go into your decision-making process. Well, a lot of them, you know, they're, they're competing. I mean, all the, all the options are listed on every exchange, and everybody's competing for business. So if there's a, you know, if there's a fair amount of volume going on, let's say, let's say I'm looking at 100. I don't know what kind of positions you trade if you trade 100s or 50s or 20s or 10s, but, you know, they do make, you know, minimum bid-ask spreads, and they will compete for business. So you might have an opportunity even if there's not a lot of liquidity. You know, I like to look for volume of, you know, maybe a couple hundred at least at a given strike, you know, in a given day if I'm going to get involved, you know, and that's if I'm trading a 10 or a 20 lot, you know. If I'm going to do a 200 lot, then obviously I don't want my size to be the, the entire day's volume uh, because, you know, obviously they keep track of those things and they're going to know when you're coming and they're going to know, you know, and they're going to adjust their markets accordingly. Um, you know, the spread site might be able to alleviate some of those problems, but you do have to examine the liquidity issue because uh, you don't want to get hung off the dry, you know, on the way in and on the way out. Okay, any questions so far? All right. Um, the variables, okay? Here's what you've got to analyze when you're looking at different trades, okay? And you're going to have to repeat this at every step in the trade once you're in the trade. Direction, okay? What's the direction? What is the magnitude? What is the velocity? What is the current implied volatility structure? What kind of volatility do I expect 
okay, both in the underlying and, and in the options. Okay, remember, implied volatility is forward-looking. Okay, the market makers and the big, the big players in the market are always looking at the volatility that's yet to come, while historical volatility is backwards-looking. Okay, so the implied volatility doesn't necessarily have to follow the historical volatility at all. Okay, because they're looking at two different time frames. Okay, historical volatility is what has already occurred and implied is what is yet to come, what people believe is yet to come. They're making their bets on this. Can they be wrong? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, there can be a lot less volatility in that time period than they anticipated, or there could be a lot more. Okay, but in general, they will adjust. The market will reach equilibrium based on that. So a lot of times the historical volatility won't follow, or the, excuse me, the implied volatility will not follow the historical volatility. Okay, so you may get a, a, a signal, okay, and some of, the, some of the work that Larry's published, especially where you'll compare short-dated volatilities um, to longer-dated volatilities and look for, you know, overboughtness and oversoldness, you may get those signals, and they may signal a move in the underlying, and you think, great, there's going to be a volatile move here, there's going to be a breakout because the six-day vol or the 10-day vol has gotten to be less than, you know, 50% of the 100-day vol, which I, I think those are fantastic signals, by the way. I do use them uh, in ways myself. And then you'll go, look at the, you'll go look at the implied volatility, okay, so the 10-day the, the historical is down here in the toilet, and you'll think, oh, great, here comes a breakout, this is a perfect situation for a straddle, and then you'll go look at the market, and the implied volatility is still way up here, okay, and that's because the guys that are trading this stuff are anticipating that there's going to be a move like that, so there's a difference, okay, in that case, then you want to alter your strategy. Originally, you might get that, you know, volatility breakout signal, and you go, right, I'm going I'm to put some straddles on in this baby, and then you check out the current price and you find out the implied volatility is still floating way up here. Okay, and then that's probably not the right strategy again. You take a different strategy. Like so the signal is still valid. You can still trade on it. You do something else. Like what could you consider in that strategy? Well, if I think the volatility is too high, then I would consider a strategy that would be selling volatility. So when I got the breakout signal, whatever direction that was, I would do something like a call ratio spread, depending on what I thought of magnitude. See, I have to go through the progression. I have to go through the progression. You know, I had, I had some bets on this week where I got this right and I got this right, um, but I got these wrong, okay? You know, I saw the VIX, you know, rolling over like everybody else. I saw that the volatilities were sky high. I saw the NASDAQ come back through that downtrend, you know, penetrate that downtrend that it's been working for so long. It's, you know, beautiful come through it, hold, look like things were going to turn around and rally. Volatility was real high. I structured my book to be short some volatility and have a rally of a moderate magnitude. <laughs> okay, well, I was wrong. You know, if things were rolling along swimmingly until about Wednesday, okay, when we all got a rocket up our keister, you know, from the Fed. So I was wrong. Okay, but these are the things you consider when you structure your book. So in that situation, if I got a breakout signal, uh, a volatility breakout signal, and I, I said, okay, great, I'm going to buy some volatility. Uh, and then I went to look at it, and it was too high. Well, I don't want to buy volatility when it's too high because that really stacks the book against me. So then I want to construct some sort of situation where, okay, let's say I'm getting a breakout signal. I have to think, is this going to be a huge breakout or a moderate breakout? You know, how can I take advantage of this? Maybe I want to buy a, a bull spread. You know, a bull spread relatively insulates you from volatility because you're buying one and selling one. And in addition, you know, you all know from the stuff that Chris showed you that the volatility of your position, of your book, is reflected in the position that you have that is nearest the money. Okay? So if I put on a 30-40 bull spread, meaning I'm long the 30s and I'm short the 40s, okay, well, if the stock's at 37, I'm short volatility. If the stock's at 32, I'm long volatility. Because it depends what gravitational field, basically, the underlying's in. If it's closest to your long strike, your position has the characteristics of long volatility. If it's closest to your short strike, it has the characteristics of short volatility. Okay, so in that case, you may have constructed a position where it starts out being long volatility, but as it moves, it becomes short volatility. Things like that. These are the things you take into consideration. And, uh, of course, your risk profile. What is my risk profile? You know, am I aggressive? Am I conservative? Am I average? What's my money management regime? These are all very personal uh, questions that you have to answer yourself when you're entering into any one of these things. Was that, was that up there, timing? No. Well, I'm looking at it. There. I might have... Uh... 
You know, when I originally wrote this, timing was on there. I think I might have accidentally deleted it or something. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's a perfect point. I mean, I mentioned it before, uh, so it was there, but yes, timing. You know, time is of the essence. There are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, thank you, there are a lot of trades, you know, where you're, you think something's going to happen in a certain direction, but you're, you know, relatively unsure of the timing. Uh, you know, you've got you've to factor that into the consideration, too. Uh, you know, if I think the market's going to make a move in a certain situation uh, and I want to buy some options, well, if it goes sideways for a week before it actually happens, you're going to lose a lot of time decay before anything actually happens. And you may want to consider a different strategy, such as a calendar spread, you know, where you can buy deferred options and sell short-dated options and take advantage of the time decay. And then when it comes time for the move to actually happen, you still have the long-dated options, you know, things like that. Um, did I skip one over here? No. Okay, so as far as directions go, okay, you've got four. Up, down, obviously. Uh, sideways, okay. With options, you can take advantage of sideways and either, okay. You can build strategies that will take advantage of a, of a market that blows out in either direction, okay. So if you come to some sort of climactic event and you're not sure what's going to happen, you know, there's a possibility you can, you can construct a strategy that will take, take advantage of a move in either direction. Magnitude, okay, large, average, or small. Velocity, high, average, or low. Okay, the current implied volatility structure, is it high, is it average, is it low? You know, and the question is always relative to what. You know, I found the best thing to look at is a, like a 100-day historical. You, know, you look at the long-term mean. We all know that volatility fluctuates around, uh, but it eventually reverts to its long-term mean. So the long-term mean is basically your benchmark uh, when you want to measure volatility. Can high volatility get higher? Yeah, definitely. Can low volatility get lower? Yeah, absolutely. Okay? But as a frame of reference, you should always look at the long-term mean, maybe a 100-day historical or a 200-day historical, something like that. Um, is it high, average, or low? And then do you have some kind of advantage or disadvantage from the skew structure? You know, look at the smile. You know, does that suit your strategy or does that work against your strategy? Are you going to force to pay an unusually high volatility for some wings? Uh, or, or can you take advantage of that by selling the stuff with the high volatility and buying the stuff with the low volatility? Does that fit into your package? That should not be your overriding concern, but you want to take every advantage you can get and, and build it into your position. Expected vol, what do you expect the market to do? High, average, or low? You know, from here. And your risk profile, again, conservative, conservative, average, or aggressive. Okay, so you want to take all these variables, and as you can see, the combinations of these things, the different combinations will give you, you know, a thousand different combinations, and build them into the appropriate strategy. Okay, and again, depending on what your risk profile is and what your comfort level is and what your personal trading rhythm is, some of these, some of these uh, strategies just won't resonate with you and just won't work with you. But you'll find out over time you know, which ones will work for you and which ones won't and which ones you're comfortable with uh, and which ones you have a kind of a, a built-in affinity for. Okay, so you want to do all this and combine this into the appropriate strategy. Okay, so let's just review our toolkit of all the different types of strategies we have and what type of battlefield situations we'd like to use them for. Okay? We've got the long call. Well, the long call is pretty obvious. That's for a buy signal, and you want volatility to be either steady or rising. So you're gonna, if you have a buy signal with a low volatility situation, that would, be a good, that would be a good situation for you. Okay? High magnitude, high velocity type of move. Long call. Okay? Short put. Now, we all know that a short put is synthetically equivalent to a buy right, all right? What type of situation am I looking for here? Okay, a moderately bullish move, okay? It's a short put. All I'm going to ever get is what I sold it for, all right? So if the stock goes from 30 to 200, pff, you're getting your two bucks, pal, that's it, all right? So it's a moderately, moderately bullish situation, okay? Even sideways, even a little bit lower, you'll get your money depending on what strike you choose. Okay, so that's a buy right or a short put. They're equal to each other. Okay, yes, sir? What time period should you use these uh, strategies for? Like the uh, long cloud, which ones do you buy? Uh, this month in the money or next month in the money? 
See, that's a timing issue. I don't know if I can really tell you that. I don't know if there's really an answer to that. I mean, that's kind of up to you on, uh, the, the question was, what time frame should I be looking at? You know, if I get a buy signal, what call should I be looking at? This month's call, you know, three month call, a leap, you know, what am I looking at here? That is really a kind, of, uh, kind of up to you. Well, uh, well you, you tell me. I mean, it, see, that, that, that one's up to you. Uh, if I think the move's going to happen right now, well, of course, I want to buy the shortest dated option possible because it's the cheapest and it's got the highest firepower, right? The short dated option is the highest gamma. But if I'm wrong by a week, then I'm left holding a pile full of dust and the, moves happen, the move happens next week. You know, so I, I, like to, I like to give myself a little lead time, a little wrongness time, and go to the second month. Uh, it depends on what type of strategy I'm constructing. I mean, this is really, this is where your system comes in. This is something I can't tell you. You know, you have to analyze. If I thought a move was going to happen in a month, I probably wouldn't buy a call today. You know, if I thought the move was going to start today and it would take place over a month, that's a different story, and that's probably a different strategy. But that, that, I mean, I can't really give you an answer to that. Um, bull spread. Okay, bull spread's a situation for a, a conservative upside play. You usually don't have to lay out a lot of cash. A lot of times, depending on where you structure it, where you build your long strike and where you build your short strike, uh, it's more or less a volatility-proof play, more or less. Okay, you're usually not exposed to too much volatility fluctuation. So if you have a situation where volatility is unusually high and you don't want to get, get hurt by buying it uh, a little too rich, you know, bull spread's probably your situation. So you're looking at a moderate magnitude, uh, relatively average to low velocity, uh, you know, volatility uh, uh, could, be, could be anywhere, but it's a good way to avoid buying too much volatility if it's too high type of conservative strategy, okay? <clears throat> a reverse collar. Now, I don't think we directly talked about this, uh, but this is a strategy, and this is a strategy for the hostile, aggressive person, you know, <laughs> like me. A, re a reverse collar is a kind of situation where you can apply a strategy in layers. Now, I didn't come up, I didn't use any examples in my stuff of doing this, but this is certainly something to consider. If you've got a, if you're highly capitalized, uh, highly aggressive, uh, this is a strategy that you can be put on all at once or put on in layers. And basically what a reverse collar is in a bullish situation is you sell a put and you take the money that you raise selling that put and use it to buy a call. Okay? So you spend no cash. Now this usually involves you doing something like, let's say the underlines at 35. This is usually something like selling the 30 put and using the money to buy the 40 call. Okay? You lay out no cash and this is called a reverse collar. Do you have unlimited risk on the downside? Yeah, well, to zero you know, because you've got a short put down there, okay? And you've got unlimited profit potential on the upside. Now, if it happens to sit there in between 30 and 40 and nothing happens, then there's no harm, okay? But below 30, you get hurt. Above 40, you are happy, okay? And so what, that's what you're doing. That's a very aggressive strategy for, for a pro or a semi-pro. I would not recommend a retail person to do that. Hang on for a second. Um, you know, an alternate strategy, something like this, might be something I, I was talking about earlier called the crank where you sell a put spread, you know, which has limited risk on the downside, limited, you know, risk, but defined risk, sell a put spread and use the proceeds to buy a further out of the money call and not spend any money. Uh, same type of situation. So that's uh, a hostile or less aggressive strategy? That's a less aggressive. Less aggressive. I'm not hostile. <laughs> not hostile, just aggressive. Uh, yes, Girish. I was going to say the same thing. Oh, about the, cr about the crank? Yeah. Yeah, okay. The bow, the bow and arrow. <laughs> I do is a money put spread and buy calls, so the whole, the whole trade is put in some credit. Yeah, I mean, basically, I mean, you, you can, it, it's all, it's all, a, it's all a cash flow thing. If you break down the actual position, we know that a short put spread is the same as a long call spread. So if I have a long call spread exposure and a long call on top of it, obviously there's two long calls and one short call, so, you know. It's, it's a boogie to the upside type of position, but you know, the, the point is that it's a thing that you can apply in layers again. Uh, you know, volatility is real high, okay, maybe I, you know, and, and I'm an aggressive guy and I've got, I got a, I'm highly capitalized and I'm willing to take a lot of risk. Volatility is, you know, high, I get a buy signal, I'll sell the put first. Okay, but I know that if I sell a put and it's going to be a high magnitude move, I'm not going to be very happy because I'm just going to be able to keep that premium that I sold it for and I'm going to miss out on the whole move. So when I do get my, the rest of my signal, uh, or maybe it comes all at once. 
then I use the proceeds to apply to a long haul and give myself an unlimited profit potential type of situation. That's an aggressive strategy for a high-risk person. Um, ratio spread pointed to the upside. This is uh, like the spreads Tony was just talking about. Where you buy one call and you'll sell two or more calls at a higher strike, basically using the money you raise financing and selling the out-of-the-money calls to finance purchasing the in-the-money call. This is a bullish type of spread where you're looking for a low magnitude or moderate magnitude, low velocity, declining volatility type of move. You are short volatility. You're short vega. You're short gamma. Okay? You're going to be naked, net naked short one option. Short two calls, you're long one. So if there's a high magnitude, large move to the upside, yes, you have the same risk profile eventually as a short call. Okay? But if it's a low, plotting, methodical, grinding move up, then as you, if you remember the risk profile that Tony put up for a ratio spread, you pass through an area of happiness before you get to your area of death. Okay? Now, the ratio spreads will test you as far as your greed goes because the closer you get to the ultimate happiness, the closer you get to the ultimate death because it reverses once it passes your short strike. So if the market goes right to your short strike, that is your area of ultimate happiness. The two options or three options that you sold expire worthless, while the one that you're long goes out to maximum value. Okay? But then, if it tiptoes past that strike, then you start to head into the valley of death. Okay? So the, the one thing I've seen people with ratio spreads do is try and hang on to them too long to try and be greedy and milk that last tick out of it, you know, and then wake up the next day and find the stock five bucks higher, and it's like, bleh. Okay. So you've got to be extremely disciplined with those because you have an open-ended risk. Um, so they are for people who you know, have a risk profile of average. Okay? One thing I'll point out about this is that it's really easy to convert into a butterfly. Okay? It's two-thirds of a butterfly. You've got one long, you've got two shorts. You know, if, if the stuff starts to hit the fan and you've got to run for cover, you can slap that last call in place real quick. And then you've still got a strategy that takes advantage of a grinding, upward, declining volatility move, but it's just a strategy of limited risk. Okay? <clears throat> Which leads me to the next one. A butterfly or a condor above the market. Butterflies and condors are target trades. You want the underlying to go to a certain zone or a certain place. Okay? So if you had a bullish signal, and depending on what the volatility background, what the volatility signals you, were, you got were, uh, you would want to construct a butterfly or a condor above the market so that the underlying could run into the short strikes. Okay? So that would be good for a bullish situation, a uh, really conservative trader. Maybe volatility is a little bit high, um, and you, you, could, uh, you could set up a situation where as the market went up, you started to run into your short strikes, which would flip your position into being short volatility, and it would take advantage of volatility coming down as the market went up. So that would be a butterfly or a condor above the market. Do you, on the butterfly or the condor, do you, is there any reason to have to wait until it's closer to expiration to take your profits off the table? Well, well, the reason, what the problem is with butterflies, and this, this has to do with care and nurturing and positions, and I, the question was, uh, do you have to wait until you get close to expiration before you take your profits on a butterfly? The butterflies do unfold quickly. Uh, uh, quicker as you approach expiration. It's probably the last two or three weeks where they go from, you know, their inert state to unfold into their, their full beauty. Um, you would have been compensated for this by not having to pay that much for them if it was a long time out. Uh, so, you know, let's say two weeks before expiration, if I wanted to buy an at-the-money butterfly, it might cost me two bucks, where, you know, two months before expiration, it might call me, cost me half a buck. Now, if it's two months before expiration and we move to my middle strike, I'm saying, Jesus, I'm here two months ahead of expiration. You know, is it still going to be here in two months? Well, it might have gone from a half to seven-eighths or something like that. So you can still take some profit, you know. But to sit and, and wait to, to make the whole five bucks uh, is going to be difficult. So there are things you can do when you get to the short strike. If you think it's going to keep moving, then you can change the position around. I, I guess what I'm thinking is if you have a butterfly with leaps, the market moves a lot quicker than you thought, and you've still got a year left. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, doing it, trying to make money on trading leap butterflies, unless the strikes are really far apart from each other, is going to be a difficult proposition at best. I mean, first of all, the markets on leaps are really wide and ugly. And second of all, the sensitivity of a butterfly in a deferred option like that is, is almost nothing. 
Uh, I don't think that's a good strategy. If you want to try and trade butterflies and make money on butterflies, you better stick to the first two or three months. Okay? You know, if you were, uh, just a second, if you were, you know, all seen and all knowing, and you knew where it was going to be or what zone it was going to be in, I mean, the one thing I will say about putting down butterflies and leaps is if you get an edge in the marketplace or you get a good signal that you can trade off of and you have leaps, it's really easy to put these things on for almost no money or even for a credit and then just leave them lying around for a couple of years and see what happens, what the hell, okay, and, and leave them there. But if you're going to try and, and, and use this as a, you know, as a trading vehicle and a trading strategy, you're going to want to stick to the front few months. But as an investment strategy, you know, just to construct them and have them lying around for get lucky, you know, lottery ticket type of stuff, then, yeah, definitely look to the leaves because they'll cost you almost nothing. Because what is the outcome? What's the probable outcome 600 days from now? Who the hell knows? I mean, one, one, butterfly, one butterfly way up here and one butterfly way down here will probably cost the same as an almost at the money butterfly because there's just a high probability it'll be up here or down here as it is here now. Um, you know, so from an investment standpoint, that might be something worth doing. Yeah, way in the back. I'm looking at this as a strategy, and I don't want to pollute my strategy by, by adding any uh, extraneous type of uh, hedges. Now, what I mean by that is the strategies that I'm going to go through and that I'm presenting here are pure uh, textbook option strategies. And I've found, this has been my experience, and I'm sure that some other people have experienced this, when you pollute them with underlying trades. Okay, you have a, you have a strategy that has a certain risk profile, and if you put an underlying trade with that, then you alter that risk profile. Now, as long as you're cognizant of what that risk profile means and how you're going to handle it, that's fine. For example, if we look at that reverse collar, right? I'm long and out of the money call, and I'm short and out of the money put. His question was, if the market trades down below the strike of my out of the money put, would I sell stock against it? Well, maybe if my view had changed to where I thought the market was going down, because as you know, if you sell stock against a short put, it becomes a short call, okay? So if I were to sell stock against that short put, now I'm long and out of the money call, and I'm short and near the money put, I have a bear spread on, basically, okay? If that's what I wanted, that would be fine. Uh, if I was using it as a vehicle to run for cover until I could unwind the spread, that would be fine as well, okay? A lot of times, you know, if, 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 if all of a sudden you have, you have a reverse collar on and the market starts tanking and all your, sell signal, or all your buy signals are nullified and you have to hit the panic button, yeah, it might be prudent to just calculate the delta, hedge that amount of stock, and then send the whole thing down to the pit as a package you know, and, and, get a, and get a tighter execution. But it's not something, if that wasn't what you wanted, it's not something you want to buy and hold. Now, you know, you're probably thinking, well, you know, I could sell the stock and then when the sell-off's over, I'll just buy the stock back in and be in the collar back in, or be in the reverse collar again. Yeah, that's up to you. I've always found it's best not to overcomplicate things. So if, if you suddenly, if that sell-off, you know, triggered you into some kind of sell mode and a, and a bear spread was what you thought was the applicable strategy, and then by all means, you know, selling the stock and converting the short put into a short call and getting into a bear spread would work, okay? But if that's not what you really wanted, then I would find that, it, I, I would think it's best just to get out. Okay, last one, and I, I gotta try and pick the pace up a little bit, is an upside back spread. Okay, an upside back spread, you've got a buy signal, you're looking for a highly volatile move, okay? High magnitude, high velocity move, a quick move with inclining volatility, okay? This is the one where you buy several out of the money options and you finance them by selling an at the money option, okay? This is the expanding, self-expanding, self-pyramiding position I was telling you about, okay? Called the back spread or the volatility spread. Okay, so you're looking for a huge move huge move up in this case. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, I want to get through all these so we can start getting into some, some examples because I know a lot of you have to leave uh, for earlier flights and stuff. Okay, going through the bearish, the bearish options or the bearish arsenal, okay? The first one, a long put, straight long put, nice and easy. When do you want this? You've got a sell signal. Volatility is either cheap or fairly priced. Okay, you're expecting a move of a higher magnitude and a higher velocity, a long put. Okay, second one, short call. Okay, you've got a bearish signal and you're looking for a move down and implied volatility is high. Okay, you're expecting a, a move down of moderate magnitude, of moderate velocity, and you want to take advantage of the high volatility by selling a call. Okay. 
If the stock goes all the way to zero, if you're at $100 and you sell a 100 call and the stock goes down to 30, you're not going to be really happy with this. Okay, you're going to make your three or four bucks and that's going to be it. Okay, so you're looking for a moderate magnitude, moderate velocity, move down under high, you know, with current high volatility conditions. Um, number three, a bear spread. Okay, you're looking for a move down of moderate to small magnitude. Uh, depending on where you construct your spread, uh, moderate to low velocity, um, and the volatility conditions can be can be anything as long as you, it depends on how you construct your strikes. Uh, it's a kind of a volatility insulated strategy, uh, sort of. Okay, this is for the the conservative approach, a bear spread. Collar, okay, reverse collar, collar. All a collar is is you're doing the opposite. You've got a sell signal, and maybe you think volatility is too high, or maybe you're just allergic to buying premium or spending money on anything. This is where you sell a call, an out-of-the-money call, and you use the proceeds to purchase an out-of-the-money put, you know, for a neutral cash situation. Okay? So you have current high volatility conditions, but you're looking for a down move of high velocity and high magnitude. You want to have the unlimited profit potential, well, it's limited by zero, of a long put, but because the volatility is so damn high right now, you don't want to pay for it, so you're going to finance buying that put by selling a call. Okay, again, this is for the aggressive trader. You do have unlimited risk. You are short a call. Okay? And this is the collar. This is the structure that a lot of people like to apply to their portfolios to protect them. Buy the out-of-the-money put, Finance it by selling the out of the money call against their long positions. If you have that position on, what do you have? I'm digressing a bit here. If I'm long stocks, let's say I'm Joe Blow, you know, investor shareholder, and I want to protect them by buying an out of the money put and selling an out of the money call, what is my position really? It's a bull spread. Okay? If I'm long a bunch of stock and I protect them by buying puts and selling calls, I've really got a bull spread. Okay? Because if I take the puts and put them together with a stock, it makes it a long call against the short calls of bull spread. So when people insulate their portfolios with this type of trade, they're basically turning an unlimited risk position into a limited risk bull spread. Okay? But for our purposes, our collar doesn't have the underline. We don't, we're not long the stock. We're just long the put and short the call. So it's an out and out short position. Okay? Uh, ratio spread down. Okay? If you're looking for a downward move of low to moderate magnitude, uh, low to average velocity under currently high volatility conditions, this is the type of spread for you. This is where you buy a near or at the money put and sell two further away from the money puts or more to finance it. Okay, you're looking for a plotting, grinding, slow, declining volatility type of down move. Now, okay, this is not for the conservative investor. This is for the average to aggressive type of risk profile. You do have a naked short put. Okay? You basically got a bear spread with an additional short put. Okay? So if it does blow out to the downside, you do have risk. You do have the exposure of a short put. So if your assumption about the magnitude and velocity of the move are wrong, you can get hurt. The good thing about this is, is once again, it's easily convertible into the butterfly. If you've got a run for cover, you can go out and buy that next strike put and flip it into a butterfly until the coast is clear and take it back off again, or maybe keep it that way if it helps you sleep at night. Okay? That's the ratio spread down. Uh, butterfly or condor below the market, okay? You think the market's going to go down, you think it's going to go to a certain zone, maybe there's a big support zone down there and you think it's going to go down there and bounce around for a while. You can construct a butterfly where the short strikes are in that support zone. You know, maybe you're going to take advantage of a 38% and 62% retracement Fibonacci zone and you're going you're to sell the, sell the options that are bouncing on those levels and, 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 and build a condor around that. That's the type of strategy you're looking for. It takes advantage of the market heading to a certain zone and also declining volatility once it gets there. So if you think the market's going to go somewhere and then hang out and go sideways, that's the strategy for you. Okay? And another, another point is that they have limited risk. Okay? Butter, uh, back spread down. Okay? You think this market's going to hell in a handbasket. Okay? And the volatility is either fairly priced or cheap. And you're looking for a high magnitude, high velocity down move. 
and you want to have maximum exposure and you think this thing is really going to roll, then you're looking for the put back spread. And this is the one again where you sell an at the money put and you use that money to finance buying two or more away from the money puts, further away from the money puts. And again, this is the self pyramiding exploding position that you've heard about. If the market turns around and goes up, you only lose what you paid for it or maybe even you did it for a credit. It depends on volatility conditions at the time. You're looking for low to cheap volatility when you put this on. Okay, and you're looking for your, expect your, your expectations for volatility is, are, it's going to explode. There's going to be a huge move. Okay, any questions about bearish strategies? Sideways trendless market. Okay, we've, we've talked about these before, uh, the long butterfly and the long condor. Those are two strategies that, that take advantage of sideways trendless markets. They take advantage, is that me? They take advantage of uh, time decay. They take advantage of volatility declining as long as the market is hovering around where your short options are. Okay? For the more aggressive, and those are, those are both limited risk applications. Okay? For the conservative to average uh, risk profile. For the more aggressive trader, there's the short straddle and the short strangle. Okay, again, taking advantage of the properties of time decay and short vega, volatility itself declining. All right, and another, another trade for a trendless market is something called a calendar spread, uh, which we haven't talked about too much. The calendar spread is a spread that's constructed by buying a deferred option of a certain strike and selling a nearer term option of the same strike. Now the calendar spread has some interesting properties. In a, in a way, it's very similar to the butterfly in that it's a target trade and you want the underlying at expiration to be near the strike where you've constructed the calendar. Okay? That way the option that you have expiring that's going off worthless will be expiring worthless while the remaining option that you still have will have its maximum value. The maximum value it can have as the other one still expires worthless. Okay? So it's a type of trade, it's a limited risk trade you can only lose what you pay for it, okay? But you can still gain money as the market goes sideways because we know that the front month option decays at a higher rate than the deferred option. So you'll have a positive theta. You'll collect money with that every day. And if the market sits in the zone around the strikes where you constructed your calendar, you'll collect money. It's also got the oddball situation in that it's long vega, okay? Longer dated options have a higher sensitivity to volatility than shorter dated options. So you basically constructed a position here where you collect money but if volatility goes up, you make money too, which is a very unusual situation. Okay, that's the calendar spread. Take advantage of the sideways trade and it's limited risk. One of my favorite spreads. Okay, the long calendar. Any questions about sideways or trendless strategies? Yes, sir. Do you use the same strike? Uh, no. You buy a deep in the money leap and you write up uh, above the market uh, short dated options against it? Right, right the money, yeah. six months out and sell current month, maybe one strike out, two strikes out. Yeah, I mean the strategy or the, 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 the question that he's talking about is you, you know, buying leaps and writing you know, uh, front month options against them and then as they expire, you know, continuing to write against them. I mean that's a, that's a very good strategy, you know, higher. This is essentially a buy write. I mean, you're buying a long dated option and you're writing above the, above the market near dated options against it. Um, you know, it's essentially a sort of a buy right with limited risk. Okay, now the risk profile on that type of trade is a lot different from the one I was just talking about. Okay, because you're buying a really very expensive long dated deep in the money option and writing above the, above the market near term options against it. It's a whole different risk profile uh, and a, a whole different strategy than what I'm talking about now, but it is a very good valid strategy depending on what your time horizon is, uh, what your cash flow situation is, and what your view on the market is. Um, for the, the one I'm talking about is one where you, they both have the same strike and you basically you're looking for the, for the market to go sideways. That one you're looking for the market to, to kind of go up, okay? Um, all right, so that's the calendar. Sideways trendless markets. Okay, breakout, either direction. Market's going somewhere, don't know. Okay, short butterfly, okay, short condor. Now, what are the short butterfly and the short condor? Okay, well, a short butterfly is a bull spread and a bear spread, okay, stacked on top of each other, except this time, 
they're pointing out. You know, they're pointing away from each other. You've got a long put spread and a long call spread, and the longs are at the same strike. Okay, so you're looking for a move up and out of the butterfly or a move down and out away from the middle strike. Same with the condor. You're buying an out of the money put spread and an out of the money call spread, essentially. Long straddle. Okay, long straddle, you're looking for a situation where the market's going to move high magnitude, high velocity move in either direction with hopefully increasing volatility. Okay, and when you're constructing this or putting this on, you should do so under conditions where the implied volatility is low or fairly priced. Okay, so you're buying a low to premium and you're looking for a huge move in either direction with increasing volatility, high magnitude, high velocity. Okay, the strangle is basically a more conservative approach to the same thought process, okay? They don't cost as much, okay? But you've got to move further to make them profitable, okay? Again, you're looking for a huge move either direction. Current volatility conditions are low, all right? Your, the expected volatility is rising or, in, or, or in increasing. Uh, high magnitude, high velocity, okay? So those are my breakout, that's my breakout arsenal. Yes, sir? What do you gain by shorting the butterfly, just less cost? Shorting the butterfly? Shorting the butterfly basically is you, it, it, you, can take, you, take, you take advantage of structural things. Okay, now remember I talked about the skew earlier where you have sometimes you have the situation where you have this. If you're looking for a breakout situation, oh, that's me. <laughs> if you're looking for a breakout situation and you've got a volatility, current implied volatility structure that looks like this, it's a smile. Okay, obviously the wings are really overpriced in terms of volatility relative to the body. This is the type of situation where you might want to consider shorting the butterfly. Okay, because the wings that you're going to be selling are way out here at these high vols, and the body that you're buying is way down here at this low vol. You know, so normally with a smiley face, you want to be a seller of butters, of at-the-money butterflies, rather than a buyer. Okay, because you want, to, you want to sell this vol and buy this vol. Okay, again, you don't want to get too anal and too hung up with that and overanalyze over it and miss the whole damn trade. You know, I might look at that, and if it's, a high, if it's going to be a high magnitude, high velocity trade, you know, I, I might say, well, the hell with it, I'm just going to buy the straddle because it's so cheap and the hell with the wings, you know, but, you know, that is a different type of strategy. <coughs> okay, any questions on breakout strategies? For a quick one, as far as with the way the market's been moving in the tech stock, it seems like the straddle, the strangle would be very successful going either way. You can maybe catch it on both ends. What I'm wondering is, is implied volatility any different as compared to a strangle as compared to a straddle? Since you've got... Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. The question is, you know, in, under under the recent conditions, you know, being long straddles or long strangles has been very profitable. And the question was, is implied volatility any different for the strangles as opposed to the straddles? And, and the answer is, you know, absolutely. Okay, there's always some sort of volatility skew. Generally, the at the money options have the cheapest implied volatility. Okay, generally they will because of the, you know, the distributions of stocks uh, over the years have, have been shown to be what they call leptokurtic, which means they they spend more time hanging around in the middle of the distribution than they should, you know, according to the normal distribution statistics. But they also spend more time in the outlying areas than they should. Okay, so the distribution is not the normal distribution curve you're used to seeing. You have one where you have a, a high peak where the market actually spends more time hanging around unchanged than it should. Okay, but it's also got these big fat tails, which means it has a propensity to, to move a lot further out uh, on the tails than it should. Okay, so for that reason, that's what generates that smile. Okay, because it spends more time hanging around unchanged than it should, the at the money options tend to be a little bit lower vol, but because it also has a tendency to take, have these huge outlying moves more than it should, the away from the monies tend to have a little bit of a higher vol. That's where you get that smile. Now, if that's the case, then the strangle is going to trade at higher volatility than the straddle. If you have this situation again, all right, and the straddle's here and the strangle's here, then the strangle will trade at a higher volatility than the straddle. This is all part of the things that you take into consideration when you're constructing your strategy. You know, if I'm looking to get long some vol and everything's lighting up, you know, blah, 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 all my decision-making process, my final decision-making process would be to look at that situation. Okay, if that's the situation, then I'm buying the straddle. Okay, I'm not going to buy the strangle. Yes, sir. Uh, underlying stock on a breakout? Uh, you're talking about a, a, a vol volatility breakout strategy? And you're just looking for an up move? No, either way. Either way, either way. oh, it's gonna, you think a stock's going to break out and go in either direction. 
Well, again, you're going to have to go through the decision-making progression that I just went through. Yeah, why don't you hang on, because we're going to do that, okay, when I get into the simulation. But you have to go through this progression. You know, what, what direction? Okay, either. Fine. That, that's one of the options. You know, magnitude, velocity. What's the current implied volatility? What's the expected volatility? What is my risk appetite? If you can, once you answer all those questions, ching, 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 a strategy will pop out. Okay? And that's what I'm trying to convey this afternoon. Okay? You could actually hire a programmer to write this for you logically. You know, if you had a drop-down window where you could, okay, uh, click, on, click on up, click on uh, high magnitude, click on uh, high velocity, click on current volatility is low, expected volatility is high, uh, risk, risk profile uh, average, you know, ding, 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 buy a call. You know, you could, you could write that logically. You know, we have. Okay? But, but uh, you know, that's the thought process you have to go through. Let's start with trending markets. And again, I'm going to go through the progression that you have to go through when your decision-making process and what a decision-making process might have been at different points in the trade. Okay? And yeah, I've constructed most of these to be winners. And yes, that is completely unrealistic. And yes, you will get burned. And I probably should have thrown a couple in here where I just got absolutely hammered and, and gone through my thought process there. But I tried to basically pick ones that were clear. Okay, and it, once again, the technical analysis I'm using is, is no rocket science. I just pulled some generic stuff together. Uh, but what's important is the thought process. Okay, cut your losses short. Let your winners run. The trend is your friend. Don't fight the trend. Okay, we've all heard this forever. Okay, cut your losses short and let your winners run. That is the hardest thing to do. Okay, that is the hardest thing to do, especially letting the winners run well, cutting the losses short. If you can master one of those two, cutting the losses short would be the one. Okay? Options uh, can really help you stick with these cliches, you know, especially letting your, your, your winners run. Okay? So let's go through the progression of a trade here. Uh, I've got Intel. Okay? Uh, I'm going to give you a series of sample trades. We'll analyze the market and the situation step by step. Okay, so situation number one. Okay, right here. You know, uh, however you want to take this one, you know, we're violating a downtrend line. We've got a, uh, a moving average crossover, so on and so forth. We're receiving a buy signal. Okay, we're receiving a buy signal. Let's go through the progression. Okay, what is my expected, a my expected magnitude of this move? Uh, this is going to be average. Expected velocity, average. Okay, this one's going to be very average, average. Current implied volatility is fairly priced. Okay, I didn't put any kind of graphical representation of that up, but going back, it was fairly priced, uh, meaning it was fairly close to what the historical mean was. Expected volatility. What am I expecting? Okay. Well, what time of year is it here? Oops, heading into the summer. My expectations are average. Risk pro profile. I'm conservative. For this trade, I'm going to be a conservative trader. Okay. So let's go through this progression. And look at the thought process. Okay, the thought process, I want to execute a conservative bullish strategy. Okay? Volatility is expected to remain relatively constant, and I expect a steady rally. I'm thinking maybe it's going to test this level here. Okay, remember all this didn't happen when the trade took place. I'm thinking maybe it's going to have a peak at this level here, okay, and possibly challenge some of these levels up here if it gets rolling. Okay? So what's my strategy selection? My selection for this scenario is a bull spread, okay? Conservative, bullish strategy uh, with, with very little volatility exposure, okay? So I'm going to execute a bull spread. Bull spreads can be selected, you know, depending on your money management regime, by where you position them and how much you spend to suit your money management regime. You know, a deeper in the money bull spread, you know, one with the strikes down here is going to cost you a little bit more than one that's constructed up here. Okay, so if you're looking at absolute dollar risk control, you know, you may want to buy a higher up bull spread uh, if, or a more aggressive one would be one that's down here. Okay, I tend to, when I'm going to put a bull spread on in the market and I have a buy signal, I tend to want to buy the option at the breakout point and sell an option that is somewhere in my target zone. Okay, in this case, after this sell off, I'd be looking for a retracement of somewhat, you know, maybe half to two thirds. So my initial target zone you know, it might be somewhere, you know, up in here somewhere. So I probably want to sell a strike somewhere around in here. Okay? So, action. I buy the July 60-70 call spread at three and a half bucks. Okay? 
So I'm buying this strike, the 60 strike, and I'm selling the 70s, okay, which is consistent with the way I think. I like to buy the option where we, where we is and sell the option where we going. Okay, and that's, that's how I try to apply the bull spread. Um, all right, so I'm paying three and a half bucks and I'm gonna construct a 10 lot. So I'm spending $3,500. The spread possibility is the difference between the strike or $10, so my reward is possibly $6,500. Okay, so my risk reward ratio is 1.85 to one, and my effective stop out price, 57 and an eighth, or 5.7% below the market where it is now. Okay, and I believe it was 60, uh, 60 and 5 eighths when we took this. Okay, <laughs> any questions so far? Oh, Jesus, <laughs> yeah. Uh, The duration is time? Yeah, time. Um, well, at the time, I mean, uh, without going into it too much, I mean, this is kind of a feel question or a system question, but, you know, if you look at the, you know, duration of the downtrend in time, you get an idea of, you see how it's kind of symmetrical this is here? You know, here's the, here's the influx point where it basically reversed. Basically, it spent an equal amount of time going up here as it spent going down here. Uh, that's a tough call. I mean, it's a feel. It's a feel call. You know, again, magnitude, velocity, uh, timing. That's something that has to be your system making those calls. Well, I mean, it's, see, I can't see the oh, I'm sorry. Now, this is in June. Well, I would suggest just tell us what, in case we want to look at it ourselves, you just tell us at the beginning what year and month we're in when we're looking at it. Okay. I mean, they're labeled at the very bottom. You probably can't see. Can you scooch that up a little bit there, Bill? Early June of 99. Thank you. Okay. And you'll be receiving these, these uh, charts, by the way. Well, we like to look at our own charting package. I understand. Okay. Sometimes I may not recall exactly what the hell was going on at the exact moment in time that, that I did this. I mean, really the point here is, is not what was going on, but what is the point here is of this exercise is the thought progression. Okay. That's the point of this exercise. Yes. Another reason to buy July is because that's when you tell earnings are, and you want to get some of the earnings left. So right. July or August, right. Uh, the next quarterly gives you some right. How did you determine your stop? My stop, I just took the uh, current stock price and the amount of money that I, spread, I spent on the spread and took the percentage. Okay? So if the stock went to zero tomorrow, I'm going to lose the $3,500. That's how I determined it. Now, in reality, you know, the effective stop, meaning I calculated if I were trading stock and I had a three and a half point stop, you know, equal to the three and a half points I spent on the call spread, what stock price I would be getting stopped out at. You know, in reality, that call spread is going to retain a lot of value. You know, even if, even if the stock were to go to 20, you know, tomorrow that spread would still have a little bit of juice left in it. So it's not realistic. But I'm looking at it, you know, in my mind, I'm throwing that money away for risk management purposes. In my mind, that is my ultimate hit. You know, so if it opened at zero tomorrow, I'm out 3,500 bucks. Okay, and that's, and that's the way I, I look at that. Okay? Okay, this is a little position analyzer, and we don't want to get, uh, oops, over here. We don't want to get too caught up in the Greeks, but inputting that position with the stock at 60 and 5 eighths with the volatility, again, whatever it was at the time, I can't recall, but it's not really the point. Uh, that position threw off a delta of almost 300 shares. You can see that I'm long gamma. <clears throat> okay, my long options are nearer to the current underlying price than my short options. So I'm long gamma. I've got, uh, hmm, how do I get a negative vega? That doesn't make sense. I should, probably should be long vega. I've got a negative theta and a positive rho. Okay, there might have been an uh, input problem there with that vega. It looks like it's backwards. Okay, but again, we don't want to get too hung up with the Greeks. Okay, we just want to think about the spreads as pure strategies and what we're trying to accomplish. All right, so that's situation one. I've got the breakout. I analyzed the situation. I analyzed the variables and I've acted on it and I put together a bull spread. Okay. No, no. Again, if you start neutralizing delta, then you take away the whole strategy. Okay. If you were to sell stock, and let's say, I, okay, I'm long 300 shares uh, at the original starting point. If you sell stock against it, well, then you've just done nothing. I mean, you have a bullish signal. You mean to be bullish. So at this point, you've done nothing. Okay. Now you're going. You might take other action later. Let's go to situation two for an example. All right. Situation two. Intel has a nice move. 
up to 67. And then you get this nice little, this ugly little reversal bar here. Okay, you got this big gap here, narrow range. You get a reversal bar. I start to get nervous. Okay, I've got a nice profit in the position. It's gone from 60 and 5 eighths to the closing price that day. I think that I'm taking is 67. Again, you've got to give me a little a waggle in here. I think I'm using the closes. All right, but I, I, don't, like this, I don't like this action right here. Okay, but I still think the, the, you know, the trend, the intermediate term trend is up. So what do I want to do? Okay, you can see the position's profitable. I'm up 1,800 bucks. All right, I've still got my delta of more or less 300. Okay, now I'm short gamma and short vega. That makes more sense. Why am I short those two derivatives? Short gamma and short vega? That's because the underline is now closer to my short strike than my long strike. Okay, so as far as the Greeks go, it takes on the characteristics of a short option position. All right, so the position's profitable, and I've got to go through my thought process. Okay, I'm going to come back to this. Let's go through the thought process first. Okay, thought process. Trader's view is unchanged. I'm still bullish and looking for a test of 70. However, my spread is now worth 5 and 3 eighths. Okay, that means I've got a 10 point call spread. It's got a current value of 5 and 3 eighths. Okay, so I've got 5 and 3 eighths on the table, and I spent 3,500 bucks to establish that. So I've got 5 and 3 eighths total on the table, okay, for a 10 point call spread. That means I'm risking. 5,300 bucks to make 4,700 bucks. Okay, and as a conservative trader, this puts me in an uncomfortable risk reward situation, and I choose to roll the spread. Okay, now let me back, back up here a second. Rolling positions, okay? Rolling positions is an option strategy uh, that you undertake, and it really, it's when you move one position from one place to another, and while you do this, you're extracting money from the market. So it accomplishes three things. You're taking profits, you're reducing risk, and you're maintaining your position in the market, okay? So I'm taking money off the table to increase my comfort zone, but it's keeping me in the market, and I'm attempting to let the winners ride, okay? And I'm able to let the winners ride because I'm increasing my comfort by taking some dough off the table. Okay, let's flip forward. Okay, action. I sell the July 60-65 call spread at three and a teeny. Okay, this takes $3,000 off the table, a little bit more than $3,000 off the table, and if you remember, I originally invested $3,500. So I've gotten almost all my money out of this position. Okay, it takes off the table and it rolls the position up. So now the position, I sold out my 60 call and I bought a 65 call. Okay, so now my position is I still have a bull spread. I'm along the 65-70 call spread, so I still have my bullish position on. Uh, now I'm long 150 deltas, and I've taken $3,000 off the table. Okay, so that reduces my risk, and now I'm ready to move on. Okay, so this, this action right here disturbed me a little bit, so I want to take a little bit off the table, but I still think that this thing's got some room to go. I still think we're in an intermediate uptrend. Question? Are you talking about here you're rolling up the strike, right? Are you also rolling out in time? Possibly. I mean, that's one possible situation. You know, I've got July's on, I put the position on in June. You know, we're getting closer to July where there might be some significant decay, although I have a bull spread, so I'm not particularly worried about that because the, the market is heading higher constantly toward my shorter strikes, which means the decay works in my favor. But at some point, if I think this is going to go on forever, I'm going to have to make a decision. Do I roll this position into July or, uh, excuse me, into uh, September, uh, or, do I, or do I just take it off and wait or, or whatever? But again, these are, these are the thought processes that you have to go through. Every, every time you get to a point, at the end of every day, where, where any kind of significant trade takes place or significant activity, you have to sit back and analyze your position and, and, and realign your views and expectations. Yes? If you would have thought that was all you were going to get, would you turn it into a butterfly? It depends. If I thought that was all I was going to get and it was going to go back down here and resume the downtrend, I'd just bail. I'd exit, take my money and get the hell out. If I thought it was going to sit here and go sideways, if I had something that was telling me that, then yeah, I might. It depends on what the volatility situation would be there. Okay, for average volatility, uh, and I thought it was going sideways, sure. You could sell the uh, 7075 and turn this thing into a fly, you know, if that's what you wanted to do. And that's exactly the thought process that I, that I want to see. This is what you've got to go through, okay, to, 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 to roll these positions along. Okay, so I've rolled my position up. Okay. <coughs> All right, situation number three. Intel's backed off. 
back to the 30-day moving average, and now it's rallied back up to 70. Okay, so let's come back down here. Now down here, you could have done any one of a number of different things. If you're, uh, you know, if you're a swing trader, if you've got uh, systems you rely on, you see how it held this 30-day really nicely. You know, possibly you could have nipped in there and bought those uh, 70 calls and just gone naked to 65, something like that. That kind of stuff is up to you. Okay, but it backs off a little bit here, hits the 30-day, and now it cruises up and makes a new high up at 70. Okay, and now you've got some sideways to lower action, which is again disturbing you. And the stochastic seems like they, hmm, you know, lower high, a little bit of divergence. Maybe that's bothering you. This is rolling over. It could be anything. Okay, again, these signals are up to you, and it's difficult for me to go back in time and tell you exactly what I was thinking. Um, but those could be some of the situations that are giving you pause. Okay, so we're up at 70. Market action and divergence give reasons for concern, okay? I'm not happy with this price behavior up here. You get this big spike up, and then it doesn't follow through, and it starts to sag back. I want to get some more bread off the table, okay? I want to get some more bread off the table and, and start preparing for the exit, okay? Although market action is disturbing, traders still think the, the stock might test the March 22nd high, okay? Which would be over here. Sensing a pullback, the trader decides to roll the position again, okay? Well, now I've got the 65-70 spread on. You know, I know how to roll an option. By rolling an op in order to roll an option, I do a spread. How do I roll a spread? In order to roll a spread, you use our old friendly butterfly, okay? In this case, I'm going to sell the 65-70-75 call butterfly for 7 8 okay? So what that did, remember my original position is I was long the 65s in here. I was long 10 of these and short 10 of these. If I sell the 65, 70, 75 butterfly, that sells out my 65, 70 spread 10 times and converts it into a, a 70, 75 spread 10 times. Okay, so I take another $875 off the table and I've rolled my bull spread up now to the 70, 75. So what have I done? I've gotten all my money out. I invested 3,500 bucks and I've now extracted 3,800, almost four grand. Okay, so no matter what happens, if this stock goes to hell tomorrow to zero, you know, I've still made almost $500, but I've still got a spread, I'm still in. Okay, so if this thing goes further, I'm still in. Okay, and you can see the Greeks down here and here's my current P&L. Okay, next step. <coughs> You know what I do? I think I'll take, I think I'll take questions kind of at the end or, or however, because I know that our time is really short. All right, Intel pulls back to the 30-day moving average. Once again, a couple of penetrations and blasts off up the new highs at 73 and three quarters, okay? Price action on July 18th and overbought stochastics are disturbing and it is also, guess what? It's expiration time, okay? You get this huge, you know, you get this huge day here, and then you have one of these days afterwards. You can see the divergence here in the moving averages. These stochastics are overbought, close to expiration. Time to boogie. Trader wants to get out. With disturbing price action, market overbought, and expiration looming, trader decides to exit. Now, obviously, there's a many different things you could have done there. Hey, I think this thing's got a lot further to go. I'm going to roll my position out to September. Hey, I think this market is rolling over, and it's, now it's going to turn ugly. I'm going to convert this uh, bull spread, you know, into a short type of position where I, maybe I'll buy the put and I'll, con I'll construct a synthetic put. There's a million different things you could do. Okay, trader exits. Sell the July 70, 75 call spread at 225. Okay, net P and L 2,687 dollars, and I'm out of the position. Okay. That's the thought process you have to go through at every significant point. You know, there are a lot of places where you're tested here. You know, if I hadn't been rolling the position all along, would I have barfed here? Would I have barfed here? There's some, there some good penetrations of the moving averages there. Would I have barfed there? Probably. Probably. But by rolling the spread along and taking the money off the table, it gave me the guts to withstand some of those tests down there along the 30-day moving average. And that's what I find really comforting about options that allows me to, to hang with trades a little bit longer, okay? And that's just an example of how you would trade a mild trend. Uh, again, what I want you to get out of this is I want you to get the repetition of the thought process, okay? Not that I have outstanding charts and outstanding moving averages or that I have a fantastic trading sense, okay? 
you know, I'm giving you illustrations here where we made money and where we had success. Uh, you know, I'm not showing you the ones where I got ripped a new one, okay, because I want you to learn the progression, okay? Any questions? I'll take like one and then I'll, I'll go on. Nothing? Okay. Sample two. Ah, this is a good one. Yahoo. You put <coughs> Yahoo up there, please, Mr. Winger. I think it was 2,600 bucks. Okay, so had you bought the stock at 60 and 5 eighths and ridden it all the way to 73, 10 times, would you have made a hell of a lot more money? Oh yeah. And how long a period is that? I think it was over the course of about uh, early June to the middle of July, so over, over a course of about six weeks. Okay, that's a long time to hang with the trade. You know, again, you go through the decision making process every day, you know, what you like, what you don't like. Uh, with the back book strategies, I mean, we tend to let them run until the, until the system tells us not to let them run. And, uh, you know, that was just one of those. Okay. The net effect of rolling it up, I mean, obviously, it, 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 but when you roll up, you know, you let yourself have less profit. I mean, that's true because you're always taking the high powered call and you're selling it and you're buying a lower powered call. Okay, but to me, the, the, the difference is, is that psychologically, it allows you to stay in the trade longer. Okay, now that wasn't a home run situation. Okay, that was a, oh, that was a good rally. You know, that was a good rally. That was a tradable rally, but it wasn't a home run situation where the stock doubled in price and, and moved astronomically or something like that. But to me, the important thing is there, yeah, if I bought 1,000 shares of uh, Intel at 60 and 5 eighths and held it all the way to 73, I would have made 12 grand versus three grand. But the important thing there was the, you know, limited risk aspect and the fact that the comfort that you achieved from rolling the position allowed you to hang with it longer. You know, put the, put the intel back up there for a sec, Bill, would you? If I had, had a naked the futures or a naked stock position or had a call that was accumulating a lot of cash value, you know, at any one of these different places here, uh, I could have and probably would have barfed, uh, <laughs> exited, exited the position, okay? But the fact that I was rolling the position along allows me to stay with it a little bit longer. That's one of the things I find highly attractive about rolling option positions along. Okay? Okay, let's go back to Yahoo. Okay, now this trade was a real reptile. Uh, scoot that up a little bit higher. All right. This was, uh, this was excellent. All right, this was last August. Um, and here we have a, a really interesting setup. Uh, you know, Yahoo, and this is, uh, you know, this is post-split Yahoo, I mean, this is recent Yahoo, um, has come down, you know, it took its, it had its big run in uh, 99, right? Uh, took its initial beating, you know, last spring, when they all did, and then we had this little long, drawn-out consolidation. I mean, you can make an argument that this is actually a triangle here, okay, and I would make that argument. Okay, but you had this long, drawn-out consolidation kind of along this trend line. You had this one outlier here. I think that was along the earnings. Um, you had this one outlier here, but then it basically consolidated in this range here. And, okay, now normally, okay, that, that's definitely a bearish, bearish uh, continuation pattern is, you know, in, in my book, okay? Would I or would I not act on that? Eh, maybe not, but look at this. This is a proprietary volatility indicator we have. It is, it's kind of a a weighted implied volatility, uh, it's a hypothetical 30-day implied volatility divided by a long-term mean volatility, okay, and it oscillates. And what's interesting with this, and basically I go looking for this every August. I go looking for patterns like this. You know, I live this, different people have approached me and said, what's your favorite strategy or your favorite trade or your favorite setup? This is, if this isn't it, this is very close to it, okay? I go looking for insanely cheap volatility. Look at this volatility indicator here in late August. I mean, this is absolutely in the sewer, this volatility, with a breakout pattern, okay? So you've got this situation where Yahoo had a really stiff sell-off, and then it bounced and kind of went sideways and consolidated here for a number of months, okay? And the volatility got to insanely cheap levels, okay? So what's the situation? I'm getting, I'm getting a sell signal, okay? What's my expected magnitude? Large. This is going to be a big move, okay? Expected velocity, high. Current implied volatility, low, okay? Expected volatility, high. What's my risk profile? I'm aggressive, okay? I'm aggressive. What kind of strategy am I going to be looking for here? 
well, I'm going to want a high volatility bearish strategy. Okay? Thought process, traders looking for a mega move, I just told you what it was, mega move to the downside. Not only that, but historic, volatility is historically cheap, and with a large move down, should explode. Trader wishes to capitalize on both. Okay, so I want to make my money both on the break in the market and the volatility exploding. Okay? How do you conclude that the move would be a mega move? Well, I, what I do is I look at the initial move. Okay, now there are various measurement objectives that you can use. I mean, you can look at any technical analysis textbook, but basically it comes from feel. You know, to me, this is just a rest stop here. It's one hell of a long rest stop. You know, and you could have gotten whipsawed or chopped several times trying to short this thing. And, uh, you know, I basically had this underlying feeling that Yahoo is just a piece of shit anyways. And I really... <laughs> and I... And I really... And I, and I really, you know, really wanted to pick on it. And, and you know, things, things that started to... You know, th this is, you know, this is a very, this is classical bearish continuation pattern action here, okay? And to me, when you get that, I mean, look at this initial move here, and then you get this, con this continuation, and usually your measurement objective is more or less this, okay, this move, a move of that magnitude. So you're looking, you know, 200 to, you know, 120, so you're looking for a 60, 80 point move here, which is, you know, really highly unusual, okay? But the real bell ringer for me is this. I'm an options guy. That's what I look for. The volatility last August in anything, you know, was in the toilet. We were choking on it. I mean, they were stuffing it down our throats. I don't know if it was just massive buy right programs, the fact that it was summer, everybody lowered their levels, but I mean, we were getting volatility shoved down our throats. You know, JDS Uniphase had gone into the S&P 500 in July and the vol went up to 100, and they were sticking it in my keister at 40, you know, a month later. I mean, we just couldn't take anymore, hardly. And then finally September 1st came, and it was like somebody rang a gong. It was like time for everybody to go to hell, and they went. You know, and, and um, but let's just go through this. Let's go through this, okay? 